This content may not be suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion advised. Indeed, there was a man standing behind us, staying out of the flashlight's reach. A zapping noise, like you hear from a taser. My stomach drops, and I start looking around a little frantically. From Disturbed Media, join your host, Chad, for true tales of horror, bizarre happenings, and unexplainable events. This is Disturbed. Welcome back in, everyone, and thanks for joining me. This week, I'm bringing you four true tales that will terrify and horrify. So sit back and listen close as we dive into the horror. We open the show hearing from Reddit user Don't Follow 2, featuring voice work by Matt Bradford, and we learn why not to follow vultures. When I was younger, about 10 years ago, I got into bird watching. I was about 12, so it wasn't really official by any means. I was just some kid that liked to sneak up on birds, take pictures, and look them up in books. I decided to start this hobby by making a list with pictures I had printed from the library of native birds in my region. Every weekend, I'd wander around the neighborhood, which was suburbs smashed haltingly against large plots of land covered in brush, in search of new birds. With a few ponds and a large creek in the area, I found quite a few within my first few weeks. However, there was one bird I had set as sort of my white whale due to its rarity in the area, the black vulture. We have tons of turkey vultures in my area. They're most common, but fewer black vultures. They're a bit hard to tell the difference if they're flying too high, and the best way to determine which vulture it is has to do with how much gray white is on their wings. If they got closer, you can eventually make out the red head of a turkey vulture, as I often did, disappointingly. Unfortunately, I can't remember the exact date or what month it was even. I believe sometime in the fall, however. But one weekend, I decided to spend the next two days searching high and low for the black vulture. I went climbing over the small wire fencing around a nearby brushy area, as per usual, keep out signs be damned, and searched. Usually you had the best luck finding scavenger birds on roadkill beside the road, and there so happened to be a small two-lane winder that mirrored the creek nearby just through the foliage, so I cut across the sort of mini forest headed in that direction. As much as it made me sad to see a dead deer or possum, it was a common sight on this road, as both sides are open with trees and undergrowth almost choking it. There are some parts of the road that almost become sort of a tunnel due to the leaves intertwining above. It was incredibly easy for a deer or some other animal to jump out in front of a car in the dark, with neither party realizing until it was too late. I didn't have much luck. There were a few crows on the smear of a squirrel, and I saw a few ducks swimming the creek beside me, but nothing big. It started getting late, but the sun was still up, and despite the dangers of walking down a forest road in the dark, I was determined to stay out as long as possible. I decided to reach a small park area at the end of the road, and then I'd make my way back. I went under a small tunnel of leaves and came out on the other side, and was delighted to see the familiar shape of a large bird in the sky, circling. It was just the right shape and size to be a vulture, but I had no hope of checking for the grayness of its feathers as the sunlight was limited. Instead, I was stuck following it as it slowly began to sink lower. And after about ten minutes or so, it landed. I carefully snuck forward, cautiously avoiding anything that could alert the bird of my presence. I sunk low to the ground, realizing that the bird had landed in a small clearing at the far end of the park. It was just a small open field, slightly tilted down a hill, with a parking lot on the top. I'd been here before, as it was a fun spot for kids to roll down the hill because of how steep it was. I approached the bird from the bottom, excitement brimming when I heard several squawks and shrieks of other birds. Black vultures are more aggressive than turkeys, and I was hoping to catch a spat. I got to the edge of the clearing and pulled out my binoculars. Two things kind of hit me at once here. 
One, I found it odd that they were in the middle of the park rather than closer to the road where you'd assume they'd find roadkill. Though, I reasoned, things could die anywhere, even in the middle of a park. However, secondly, it smelled awful. The scent was rather light, but I've been known to have a really sensitive nose and just this sharp, coppery scent, like when you pull rotten ground meat out of a bag. I'd smelled roadkill before, and in the heat of the day, it smelled bad, but nothing like this. When I put my binoculars to my eyes, I expected a deer corpse and birds fighting. I never in a million years thought I would see a corpse of a completely different kind. The birds were there, and I remember the faint pang of excitement I still had recognizing the proud head of a black vulture, before the image of it sitting on the chest of a naked woman sucked the life out of me. I was frozen, and I couldn't look away. My throat tightened with vomit, and I could not look away. The birds had done surprisingly little to her body. She had what I thought were cuts, but most of her was intact. What wasn't, the birds were at. Her eyes, lips, and genitals were red and shredded. If there was a big, defining wound, I, I missed it, between the gathering of the birds and the fading light. What I did see, I can never forget. I haven't forgotten. I can pull up the image so clearly now, even after all this time. She was pale, almost blue in places, with blonde, crinkled hair. I sat there, stupidly, for who knows how long as the sun sank below the trees. This was a time before cell phones were a common thing, and I had quite a hike back home. I realize now that I was in shock, and I could only move when the sudden fear that whoever did this could be nearby hit me. I forced myself to slowly waddle backwards into the trees, not taking my eyes off the body. I didn't want to turn around for some reason. I was so scared someone would be behind me. I thought if I just backed up forever, maybe nothing would happen. It was dusk, and suddenly there was light. High beams from the top of the hill. A single pair. I heard the screech of tires as the car wheeled out and listened to it veer off to the left and away down the road opposite in the direction I was headed. That was the last straw, and I ran the entire way back the second I could no longer hear it. I crashed through at least a mile of brush, and while I was smart enough to have boots and thick jeans on, my arms were bare and bleeding by the time I stopped. I paused midway through the brush by my house, realizing that, embarrassingly, I had pissed myself in fear at some point, before nearly crawling my way through people's yards to get home, avoiding all passing cars. The horror didn't completely end there, as I was home alone until past midnight as my mom worked late at a diner nearby. It's stupid, and I regret it to this day, but no, I did not call the police instantly, nor my mom. I was stupidly afraid that if I did, my mom would get mad at me. I would never be allowed to go outside again, or worse, that they wouldn't believe me for some reason. I locked all the doors, double-checked, took a quick shower, and locked myself in my room. I had fallen asleep somehow by the time my mom came home. I confronted her in the morning, at least. By that time, when we made the call together, the body had already been found. He took my statement. He never got any calls back. I uh, stopped birdwatching. You're listening to Disturbed from Disturbed Media. Next up, we check in with Reddit user Soggy Cheeks, featuring voice work by Kiona Bashful Echo, and we encounter someone with bad intentions. So I was on the way home from Arby's with a mint chocolate shake, zoned out for a sec, and almost didn't notice his car. I tried just letting him through, but he insisted I go on ahead. Didn't think much of it, and just continued walking. He drove on ahead and parked his car near some apartments. He had on a black polo shirt, so I assumed he was just dropping something off for a job or something. As I kept walking, he approached me and offered me a $20 bill. I asked why, but couldn't understand what he said in response. I refused, since I know what's best for me. However, that didn't deter him. He grabbed my waist, and I stepped to the side. He then started pulling me towards his car. I bit his hand so he wouldn't silence me and made sure to scream as loud as possible to try and attract any bystanders if I could. 
he managed to get me into his car, and just before he could close it, I stuck my foot through the door to keep it open. I then got out and made myself go limp, since adding dead weight without warning creates a sudden resistance and makes it harder for them to grasp you. Due to this quick thinking, I was able to get away unharmed. I quickly booked it and got on the phone with my mom once I was at a safe distance. I made sure to stay on the phone until I got back. After that, I'd taken some time to calm down and waited for the cops to get there to get my statement. The officer ended up praising my quick thinking, telling me that I'd luckily done everything right in this situation. Please, guys, take self-defense seriously. I've only ever had a week-long course, and just that alone had managed to save my life. I didn't remember too much from my self-defense course and only used the basic techniques that I'd remembered, which was making noise, dropping my weight, and checking behind me. Any other actions I'd taken were a result of logic and quick thinking. Chances are, if I'd gotten more self-defense training, it likely wouldn't have been as close of a call as it was. Also, never accept money from strangers. While there are good Samaritans, there's also people who don't have your best interest in mind. If you do think they have good intentions, make sure to double check by asking why they're offering you money. If you don't get a good legitimate reason, then make sure you refuse. If you refuse and they still persist, then get away immediately. We cover some pretty terrifying stories here on Disturbed, but there's nothing quite like that real horror of coming home from a long day of work and deciding what to do for dinner, and then maybe finding out you don't even have what you need to make it. Luckily, HelloFresh has you totally covered to make that stress of planning and shopping just melt away. No more scouring the grocery store for that one ingredient to complete your recipe. HelloFresh takes away all that hassle by delivering fresh, pre-portioned ingredients, so you have exactly what you need and helps you cut down on food waste. And think about this, it's not just dinners. You get to choose from over 40 different weekly recipes. Not only that, but you can choose from over 100 items to round out your order. From snacks and quick lunches, to desserts and pantry necessities. All of it arrives on one box on the delivery day of your choosing. Now, my favorite part about using HelloFresh is really just how much time I end up saving. From planning to prepping, all I have to do is follow that recipe with the given ingredients, and even I can turn out a super tasty recipe. And trust me, that's saying a lot. My favorite so far is the mozzarella crushed chicken. It's absolutely delicious. And one of the biggest things I've noticed is that they care about quality. What they do is pick their seasonal ingredients at peak ripeness, and they travel from the farm to your home in less than seven days. And you can tell that freshness just sets them apart. And you know I'm going to bring you a great deal to go along with it. So go to HelloFresh.com slash Disturbed16 and use code Disturbed16 for 16 free meals plus free shipping. That's HelloFresh.com slash Disturbed16 for 16 free meals plus free shipping. HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. For two decades, FBI agent Robert Hansen sold secrets to the Kremlin. He violated everything that my FBI stood for. People died because of him. Hansen was the most damaging spy in FBI history, and his betrayals didn't end there. Do I hate him? No, I don't hate anyone. But his motive, I would love to know what his true motive so I can get that out of me. How did he do it? Why? Listen to Agent of Betrayal, The Double Life of Robert Hansen, wherever you get your podcasts. You're listening to Disturbed. Now, back to the horror. Next up, we hear from Reddit user Z4160, featuring voice work by Tanya E.B., and we have an encounter in the forest. First post here. This just happened about one hour ago, so my memory is fresh. First off, I'm living very rural, in a small village with maybe 10 to 15 houses, but close to the highway. You can drive there within maybe five minutes, and also about 10 minutes away from the town. If you cross the street, it just takes you about 10 minutes to walk to reach the forest. First Christmas day. In the afternoon, my partner and I decided to go for a little digestive walk, as we were really stuffed from all the food. It was about 1700, and already dark when we left, and we had a big and bright LED flashlight with us. 
I also took my camera and my flash, as I love taking pictures of nature at night. We decided to walk on a little country road towards the forest, and then turn right, following a small graveled cycle track close to the forest border, which connects our village and the next, maybe 15 to 20 minutes walk between villages. In the middle part of the track, you have to walk through a small bit of forest. It's rather dark, and the trees are very high and quite dense. When we entered, I saw our flashlight reflecting on something and recognized a car being parked there on the side of the track, close to the trees. This struck me as odd, as cars are not allowed to drive there and the path is very narrow and hidden, so I was a bit cautious. My partner pointed the light inside of the car and it seemed to be empty. I also noticed the windows were frozen, so it must have been parking there for a while. A bit in front of the car, I spotted a tree with an intriguing structure, and I asked my partner to point the flashlight towards it so I could focus better and photograph it with my flash. After I took a few images, my partner told me, Um, there is someone standing behind us in the middle of the road. He is looking at us. Nobody was following us the whole way. I kept looking around and behind us occasionally because at this time in the evening and close to the border of the forest, There are boars sometimes, and it's mating season, so they are more aggressive than usual. Indeed, there was a man standing behind us, staying out of the flashlight's reach. He wasn't saying anything, just standing there and facing us. At first, I thought he might be startled, as it may seem a bit weird if someone's just taking photos around your car. It was not even legal to drive on that path with the car. I decided to get up and confront him from a distance, explaining to him that I was just taking photos of that tree. He didn't react and still just stood there. I then went on to ask him if he needed some light, and he replied that this wasn't necessary. It was odd, but I was still calm, sure about there being a normal explanation for his behavior. Nonetheless, my partner and I decided to just GTFO and followed the path leading to the next village. It was maybe five to seven minutes until we reached it. I remember the letters on his license plate, not the number so, unfortunately, and googled it, and it turned out that he was from a city about six away from our village. Mind you, the country I live in is in a very strict lockdown right now, so you are only allowed to travel, even by car, if you have very urgent reasons. After we reached the first lantern of the next village, we looked back and observed the car driving a bit out of the forest, turning around and going back inside. I was able to see that he parked there again and turned the lights off. He didn't leave the forest. We then went home on a much longer way than initially intended, as I didn't want to go back there for obvious reasons. Our flashlight battery died on the way, and my phone battery was low, so I didn't want to call the police back then, but I called them as soon as I arrived home and gave them all the details. Big regret that I didn't memorize the whole license plate, but it was just so surprising that I seriously didn't think about it. Also, it only occurred to me as really strange when I thought about the frozen windows and that he could impossibly have walked behind us. Plus, him having no light and not responding, he did seem to be sneaking up on us when I sat down to take the photo. I think I was very lucky to have my partner, the camera, and the bright light with me. I don't want to imagine what could have happened if I was alone. So, creepy guy sneaking around in the forest? Let's not meet. Edit. When I told my housemate, she theorized that he may have been spying on the houses very close to the forest border, as you can easily look into their backyards without being seen. You have to walk a bit up the hill and further about five minutes. I think it's likely. I had the thought of photographing the car when I entered the forest part of the path, but somehow I felt unwell about it and decided to not do it, despite it being an interesting scene. In hindsight, I believe this saved me, as he must have hidden behind the trees close to the car and forest entrance. If he was really planning a burglary, or worse, dumping a body, I think it's not unlikely he may have attacked me if he realized I had a potential photo of his car with a recognizable license plate. Update. Went back and found a tape marking on one of the trees, a very small hideout, more to store things than to sit in, as well as some cut off part of a backpack
Get your voice on Disturbed with our hotline, available 24-7, completely free. Tell us your experience or just leave your comments on the show. Visit hotline.disturbedpodcast.com on your mobile device or computer. And finally, we close out the show hearing from Reddit user Confusionitis, featuring voice work by John Patnode. And we hear that electric zap. This happened probably five or six years ago. I think I was 18 at the time. For starters, I lived in a city where neighborhoods and forests kind of blend together. There are plenty of wooded areas where people go have bonfires and parties. One night, after discovering that all of our usual spots were crowded with people, I suggested we go to a spot that I had been to a few times nearby. I'd been there multiple times, but only during the day. The street where we parked is maybe 200 feet from the tree line. It's your average middle-class neighborhood. Nothing crazy is really known to happen there. So we walk in, start a bonfire, and we're all having a good time. Some of us are drinking and smoking a bit, myself included. About 45 minutes pass, and I'm a little intoxicated, but nothing major. And over the sound of our quiet music and my friends talking, I hear something odd. I can't make out what it is, so I figure maybe I'm just hearing things. Maybe another 10 minutes go by, and I hear it again. A little better this time. It still sounds relatively far away, but it sounds like Velcro tearing. I stop and just kind of sit there trying to listen while my friends carry on laughing and talking. They haven't seemed to notice. And that's when I heard a sound I was very familiar with. A zapping noise, like you hear from a taser. Very brief, but unmistakable. My stomach drops, and I start looking around a little frantically. My girlfriend at the time was the first to notice my distress. She asks me what's wrong, and I explain, and she immediately starts worrying. She gets my friends to quiet down, and we all just sit there and listen for a bit. Then we all hear it. An electric zap. Brief, again, but we all know that sound. We all start panicking a bit, and we quickly put out the fire while asking each other what the fuck that was or where exactly it was coming from. We're all scared to walk out. It's only maybe a five-minute walk to the street, but it's dark. We all muster the courage to finally walk the path out, and we don't run into anyone. We finally get to the street and start walking to our cars, nervously laughing and relishing being under street lamps again. I see him first. He's walking towards us. Not at us, just walking in the direction we just came from. Slightly to the right of us. He's holding a stick of some sort. It scared me at first, but for a brief second, I calmed myself. It was a pretty safe neighborhood that I knew really well, and it was really common to see people out walking at night. But then I notice he's looking right at us. That stare is burned into my mind. We pass each other. My friends and I are all silent as we're having this stare down with this random man. And that's when it happened. He doesn't break eye contact, holds up the pole, and smiles this creepy fucking smile. His eyes are open so wide, the end of the stick lights up bright, and that same zapping sound happens again, much louder this time. He's holding a fucking cattle prod. We live in a city, no farmland nearby. No reason to have a cattle prod. My friends and I are silently shitting ourselves as he walks past us, maybe 20 feet away, and goes straight into the woods without a flashlight or anything. We all got into our cars and peeled out of there. We never went back to that spot. Follow our social channels on Facebook and Instagram at Disturbed Podcast and on Twitter at Disturbed underscore pod. Thanks to our sponsor, HelloFresh. Please use our special link at HelloFresh.com slash Disturbed16 to get 16 free meals plus free shipping. Using our link helps support the podcast. Don't forget you can send in your own true terrifying tale at disturbedpodcast.com slash submit. 
And if you'd like to support the show and gain access to bonus episodes, ad-free content, and early releases, visit patreon.com slash disturbedpodcast. And a big thanks to our newest supporters, Tina Andro, Rayon, and Linda Figuera. Thanks to all of you for supporting the show. Music by Carl Casey at WhiteBatAudio and Co.ag. Thanks for listening. We'll be back next Thursday with a brand new episode. And don't forget to stay safe out there, y'all.